Good morning, or good afternoon, all. It's a pleasure to be here to, to talk to you. Um, I will tell you a little bit about the work that uh, my group has been doing with particular focus on uh, the modulation of host innate immunity upon bacterial infection rice. I will sort of summarize work of about 15 years done by uh, different uh, graduate students, postdocs, and uh, uh, project fellows working in my lab. And Chandan here is one of those with whom I've had a pleasure to work on this project. I'll briefly give you an overview of the work that we have been doing. Now, before we get into the, uh, uh, the actual work per se, let me give you a little bit of an introduction to the area of plant innate immunity. Now, plants don't have uh, an adaptive immune system, but they have a very efficient innate immune system. And uh, there are two layers to this innate immune system. The first layer is uh, uh, you know, activated by receptors that are present at the cell surface. And these receptors detect extracellular signals. And they are triggered by two major categories of molecules. And uh, uh, one category is what are called pathogen-associated molecular patterns or PAPs. And uh, these detect, these receptors detect molecules such as flagellin, lipopolysaccharide, or chitin that are signature molecules of a whole class of microbial organisms. For example, uh, flagellin is present in all bacteria that have flagella. And there are signature motifs that are present in flagellin that plants have learned to recognize. There's a receptor on the plant cell surface present probably practically in all plants that recognizes flagellin and activates a new uh, response. Now, lipopolysaccharide, as you know, is present in all gram-negative bacteria. And recognition of certain motifs in the lipopoly, certain constituents of the lipopolysaccharide, there are receptors that recognize and again trigger an immune response. So by uh, interacting with, by recognizing flagellin, the plant is able to recognize when a bacterium is actually around. And uh, uh, lipopolysaccharide is the same, that tells them that the gram-negative bacterial pathogen is around. And plants have receptors for chitin, which again is present in uh, many fungal uh, uh, cell walls. So, so there are molecules like that, that plants have learned to recognize as indicators of the presence of a microbe around. And that microbe can be a friend or a foe, but often the plant actually wants to know if a microbe is around, and then it can make a decision about uh, inducing the immune system. So that's one category of molecules that uh, these are the pathogen associated uh, molecular patterns. Then there's a second category of uh, uh, molecules that are uh, released upon microbial attack that again plants have learned to recognize. And these are what are called damage associated molecular patterns. And as I'll tell you as we go along, uh, one category of these dams are cell wall degradation products. Now plants have cell walls that you know, have to be degraded when a microbial pathogen wants to attack the plant. And that process release, results in release of cell wall degradation products. That is again a mark of infection. So these two molecules, PAMPs and DAMPs, are recognized by receptors at the cell surface and that triggers an immune response. So together, PAMP and DAMP triggered immunity is referred to as pathogen triggered immunity. And that's the first layer of the plant immune response. And uh, this particular system, when it's activated, that takes care of most potential pathogens of plants. So, so PTI takes care of most potential pathogens. Okay. But the, the, the bacteria or fungi, the microorganisms that have learned to cause disease on plants have developed the capability of suppressing PTI. So pathogen by definition must be capable of suppressing this layer one. If it is able to suppress layer one, then it can go on and cause disease in the plants. And often this suppression occurs through secretion of certain molecules. Often these are proteins that are secreted into the plant cell 
and there they interfere with the signal transduction that occurs during activation of PTI. And I will discuss some of these as we uh, as we go along. Okay, so so pathogens have learned to suppress PTIs, and they do that through proteins that they secrete into plant cells. And we will discuss how this happens. Now, what plants have done is that they have now evolved a second layer of the innate immune system. That's what is called, that's what I refer to as layer two. And here the receptors that recognize the effectors are intracellular. They're within the plant, uh, within the plant cell. And as I said, they're triggered by effectors that are secreted into plant cells by the pathogen. And this second layer is called effector triggered immunity. And in this interaction between rice and the bacterial pathogen, I will discuss how the, bat the bacterium has learned to inactivate both the first layer, which is PTI, and the second layer, which is ETI. So how this occurs, I will discuss as we, uh, as we go along. But what, uh, what keeps plants protected from pathogen is the fact that every cell in the plant is able to trigger layer one of innate immune system. And they recognize, it, it looks like there are a large number of receptors that can recognize a large number of potential molecules that can elicit uh, PTI. It is because of this that they are able to actually stay healthy, although they don't have a, an adaptive immune system. So layer one is can be triggered by every cell in the plant and recognizes a very wide range of molecules. And if layer one is, uh, uh, is inactivated by the pathogen, there's a layer two that recognizes these molecules that suppress layer one and again trigger an immune response. So we'll discuss, I'll take you through this uh, uh, journey of how we found out how some of these things happen during the interaction between rice and this bacterial pathogen. So rice is the host plant and this bacterium called Xanthomonas arise pathogen arise. I will refer to it as XOO for short. And XOO causes this disease called bacterial blight, which is a very serious rice disease. And as Lawrence was mentioning, I will talk to you at the end about how we have been able to develop some rice varieties that are resistant to uh, this disease. So uh, I was mentioning that uh, uh, the, the microbe, so the, the plant cell wall is something that separates plant cells from uh, animal cells and that we've learned in basic biology. Okay, and this, cell wall acts as a jacket that surrounds the cytoplasm and any microbe that wants to get access to the nutrients that are inside must be able to degrade that, that cell wall. Okay. And uh, many years ago, a graduate student in my lab was looking at virulence functions of this XOO bacterium and he found that there were a number of cell wall degrading enzymes that this bacterium was secreting and uh, these target See, the plant cell wall has constituents like cellulose, hemicellulose, you know, diff different kinds of uh, uh, pectin. So different kinds of polysaccharide constituents of the cell wall and the bacterium makes enzymes that actually target each one of them. Okay? And by making mutations in these cell wall degrading enzymes, he was able to show that, yes, these cell wall degrading enzymes constitute quantitatively, contribute quantitatively to the ability of the bacterium to cause disease. So if you knock out one of those enzymes, virulence drops a little bit. If you knock out two of those enzymes through mutation, then virulence drops even further. So they are contributing quantitatively to virulence and they're very, very important for virulence. So that part was clear to us by around 2002 or so. But uh, so till then we were primarily looking at virulence of the bacterium on Okay, but then we realized that there were studies done uh, in the 1980s in the United States by a very good, uh, uh, famous American biochemist. What he actually he was working on plant cell walls, and what he and his group, his name is Peter Arbuschein, and what he and his group showed working on a fungal pathogen of soybean is that there are enzymes that soybean uh, pathogen secretes, this fungal pathogen secretes. 
they degrade the pectin component of the cancer bone, and this is a pectinase. What Peter Albersheim and his group showed was that when this pectinase acts on soybean cell walls, it releases certain soybean, uh, certain cell wall degradation products. And these cell wall degradation products are basically byproducts of degradation pectin. They are soluble. And if he purifies them and treats uh, soybean cells with them, they elicit immune responses. So there are defense responses that had already been characterized in plants. And those were triggered when these cell wall degradation products are uh, exposed to, cell, uh, to soybean cells. Irrespective of the pathogen doesn't have to be around, the cell wall degradation, degrading enzyme doesn't have to be around, just the purified cell wall degradation products. If you treat them on soybean cells, that triggers immune responses. Now that was in soybean and it was with a, uh, an enzyme secreted by the fungal, uh, uh, by the fungal pathogen. What we wanted to know whether the cell wall degrading enzymes that this bacterial pathogen is secreting, would they trigger immune responses in, uh, uh, in rice? And to cut a long story short, what we actually found was that Yes, these purified, because we had these purified enzymes in our hands, we could actually treat the rice cells with them and then see if there is an immune response that is induced. And as I'll show you a little bit later, what are the assays for determining whether an immune response is activated, I will show you a little bit later. But for now, yes, there is. These enzymes that are important for virulence are triggering defense responses in rice. Okay, so that gave, the, gave, gave us a conundrum. The very enzymes that are required, that are essential for causing disease, and we were able to demonstrate by then very clearly that if these enzymes were not there, the bacterium can't cause disease. So the very enzymes that are needed for causing disease are actually acting like double-edged swords. You know, they are actually triggering a defense response. In the and so that gave us a puzzle. How does the bacterium actually be able to cause disease when the very functions that it needs to cause disease are actually triggering immune responses. And uh, what the student in my lab, uh, a PhD student who was working on this problem, he was able to show that the bacterium is able to suppress the immune response in the sense that if we just treat only with the cell wall degrading enzyme, there is a defense response induced. But if we mix the cell wall degrading enzyme with the bacterium, and treat the plant, that results in suppression of the defense response. So the defense response is not triggered if we mix the bacterium along with the cell wall degradation. There is some capability in the bacterium to suppress this immune response. So, so the next question was, how does the bacterium, if it is able to suppress immune response, how does it suppress the immune response? Now, by that time, there was work that was going on in a bacterial path, a pseudomonas pathogen of uh, Arabidopsis. And they were looking at, lots of groups were looking at how this pseudomonas pathogen suppresses flagellin induced. I told you that flagellin is a pathogen associated molecular pattern. So flagellin produced by this pseudomonas pathogen triggers immune responses in Arabidopsis. And what those uh, several groups had actually shown was that the pseudomonas pathogen uses a bacterial type 3 protein secretion system. Now, the protein, the type 3 protein secretion system is a type of secretion system present in gram-negative bacteria that transfers effectors directly from the bacterial cell into the eukaryotic host cell. So it was well characterized in animal pathogenic bacteria where it was first identified. Subsequently, in plant pathogenic bacteria, these groups working on Arabidopsis had shown that that pseudomonas pathogen uses this type 3 secretion system to suppress flagellin induced immune responses okay, uh, uh, in, in, in Arabidopsis. What uh, the student in my lab thought was that, okay, if the pseudomonas pathogen suppresses flagellin induced immune responses using the type 3 secretion system, would the bacterial pathogen of rice also suppress? cell wall damage induced immune responses using the same type 3 secretion system because this uh, Xanthomonas bacterium, this XOO bacterium does have that secretion system. 
So what he did was that he mutated the type 3 secretion system in this XO bacterium. And lo and behold, he found that, yes, it can no longer, uh, a mutant of XO that is defective in the type 3 secretion system cannot suppress cell wall damage induced immune responses. Not only that, this type 3 secretion system, uh, secretion system defective mutant, continues to produce cell wall degrading enzymes because they are secreted by another secretion system. Okay, so bacteria have different secretion systems and the one that secretes the cell wall degrading enzymes is different from the type 3 secretion system. So what he was able to show is that not only is the type 3 secretion system defective mutant unable to suppress plant innate immunity, it itself is an activator of plant innate immunity because it continues to produce these enzymes that trigger the immune responses. And uh, uh, this next slide actually gives you a couple of assays that we use in the lab to actually determine when is the plant innate immune response activated and uh, what is the functional significance of this uh, immune, uh, immune response. I mean, how strong is this immune response? Now, what I'm showing you here are uh, in the top layer, this, this top panel, these are two rice leaves. This rice leaf is injected with a buffer. So the bacterium grows within the midveins of rice leaves. That's part of the circulatory system of the plant. So by actually growing inside the midvein, it can travel from one part of the plant to the other parts. Okay. So, so we injected a little bit of buffer into the midvein. And about eight, 10 hours later, we subsequently inoculated at another point on the same leaf, this XO bacterium. Now, these control leaves that are infected with the bacterium, you can actually see this uh, 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 sort of reddish brown lesion. That's the bacterium, that's the disease that the bacterium, that's an outcome of the disease the bacterium is causing. So this is the, the symptoms of bacterial infection. Now, into the same leaf, uh, into uh, another leaf on the, on the same plant, we can inject a purified, one of these purified cell wall degrading enzymes. Uh, it's a cellobiocytes enzyme that degrades the cellulose component. So if you inject either that or this type three secretion system defective mutant, either one of them, if we inject into the midbrain and subsequently inoculate with the XO bacterium, you can actually see as you, as I've shown here, that disease either doesn't happen at all or what I have not shown here, when even if the disease happens, the lesions are very limited. So if you inoculate with the bacteria, maybe it will move a little bit forward and then, and then stop. So this actually gives you an indication of what the power of the plant uh, innate immune system is, this first layer of the plant innate immune system. It is a very significant uh, part of the plant defense arsenal. And if activated, it can actually inhibit the pathogen from crop. Okay, so what we are actually doing here is we are triggering the plant innate immune system by either taking the purified cell wall degrading enzyme or a variant of the, uh, of the pathogen that cannot suppress innate immunity. Either one of them if we inoculate, that will trigger the plant innate immune system. Okay, so this shows you the power of the plant innate, uh, the, the power of uh, layer one of the plant innate immune system. This is just in rice, but the, uh, the dogma in the field is that every plant has such an innate immune system and that when activated, it can have the same level of effect. And that's how plants actually stay free of disease most of the time. Okay, so this is what the plant innate immune system does. So this is a functional assay for looking at what the activation of the innate immune system does. What we most often use in the lab is another assay that is a hallmark of triggering of the, uh, the layer one of the plant innate immune system. And that is what is called deposition of a polysaccharide called callose. Now, these bright spots that you see here, you know, are all callose deposits. Now, what is actually happening is that at the plant cell wall, at the point of contact with the pathogen, what the plant does is it tries to strengthen the wall. If somebody is trying to break down, you know, a particular getting get into your house and they're trying to drill a hole in your wall, 
if you have the capability to be able to seal off that wall, that's what you would actually do. So that's what the plant is actually doing. As the pathogen is trying to drill holes in the wall, it's actually producing these callous deposits. They actually happen very quickly. They get deposited and, uh, you know, that it tries to seal off this hole, uh, this, uh, uh, this particular hole that's being drilled by the pathogen onto the, uh, onto the cell wall. And not only that, these callous deposits are loaded with antimicrobial compounds so that the pathogen that comes in contact with them, essentially, they get, they get killed off. So this is a signature of uh, triggering of layer one of the plant immune system that is studied in a number of different plants. So in rice, if we infiltrate either the, if we infiltrate the buffer, we get a few callous deposits here. And that is because the act of infiltrating the buffer itself damages the cell walls and then that triggers immune response. But if you treat with either the cell wall degrading enzyme per se, which can now cause damage at many, many different locations, or this uh, mutant that is defective in the ability to suppress innate immunity, you get many, many more callous differences. So these are the two assays that we use. Along with it, there are many, many other classical assays for triggering of the innate immune response that we have shown get activated in the plant when you treat with either a cell wall degrading enzyme or this mutant that's defective and triggered in suppression of native. Okay, and this was done by a, a PhD student called Gopal Ji Jha, and uh, we published this many, many years ago. Okay, so this gives you an idea of what the plant innate immune uh, response actually is. And mostly in the rest of the talk, I'll giving you data about our work on this particular, uh, just the callous deposition assay, but each of them we use other in uh, other outputs to show that yes, indeed the plant innate immune response is being activated. So, so so far what I've told you is that yes, the bacterium secretes cell wall degrading enzymes. These are needed to cause disease, but they trigger an immune response, and that immune response is suppressed by the bacterium using a type three secretion system. Now, this type 3 secretion system secretes proteins directly into, into plant cells. So the next question was, what are the bacterial functions that are involved in cell wall damage, in suppression of cell wall damage induced immunity? So we should be able to identify them if our hypothesis is that, yes, there are proteins that suppress innate immunity. Now, what happened was that by the time another PhD student joined the lab and took this work forward, uh, her name is Dipanvita Sinha. And by the time she had actually started this work, a group in Japan headed by a person called uh, Seiji Suge, what they had actually shown was that this XOO bacterium secretes at least 16 different T3S secreted proteins. And these are what are called non tile effectors. Right now, don't worry about what they are. If you're interested in what are tile effectors, what are non tile effectors, we can discuss that later. But this is one class of molecules one class of proteins that this XO bacterium secretes into rice using the type three secretion system. And what Dr. Seiji Suge showed that at least 16 such proteins are secreted into rice by XO using the type three secretion system. This number has gone up a little bit now, there are about 20 or 22 such proteins, but at that time there were 16 of them. What deepened with the reason was that one of one or more of these 16 proteins must be involved in suppression of innate immunity if our hypothesis is correct. So one of the proteins going through type 3 secretion system should be suppressing innate immunity. And she designed assays where she cloned these 16 different proteins individually into agrobacterium vectors. Now, agrobacterium is a natural plant genetic engineer that transfers DNA into plant cells and it encodes certain proteins in the DNA that get expressed within the plant. And once they are expressed within the plant, they can modulate plant physiology. So what Dipanvita did was that each of these 16 proteins, she cloned them into agrobacterium vectors. And now what she would do is, see the same assay where she was treating with the cell wall degrading enzyme and that triggers immune responses. Along with the cell wall degrading enzyme, she mixes an agrobacterium that has one of these 16 proteins. So you are now delivering, along with the cell wall degrading enzyme, also this protein that can potentially suppress that. 
And she was trying to see whether any one of these 16 can suppress the immune responses. And what she found was that it's not just one. There are four different proteins out of these 16. Each one of them, when individually delivered into rice cells, can suppress rice innate immune responses. And these proteins are called xanthomonas outer proteins. That's how the whole field refers to them, or SOPs. And there are, as I said, up to 20 now, maybe even more than that, that exo secretes into rice. And these proteins are referred to as they've got alphabets actually, xanthomonas outer protein N, Q, X, and Z. There are many of them. Right now, you can think that there are four of them. You don't need to remember ZOP, N, Q, the alphabets, but right now, just think that there are four proteins that XO secretes into rice using the type 3 secretion system that suppress rice innate immunity. And how is that assay? This is one example where she is doing in transient assays. So, this is the cell wall degrading enzyme and co treatment with the cell wall degrading enzyme. And this is co treatment with the cell wall degrading enzyme and an agrobacterium construct that has one of these proteins called ZOP. Okay. If you co-treat with, uh, with the cell wall degrading enzyme, this agrobacterial strain that has ZOPQ, that means ZOPQ gets into the plant cells, gets expressed there, it now suppresses immunity. So we see very sig significantly reduced levels of calories. A few are there, but they're substantially reduced as compared to just treatment with the cell wall degrading enzyme. Now, what Dipanvita also actually did was, now there are four of these, these genes. She started mutating each one of them. So you mutate ZOP N or you know, any of those, or ZOP Q or X or Z, and see what happens. Can it suppress immunity? If you mutate one of them, the, the bacterium can still suppress immunity. If you mutate two of them, the bacterium can still suppress plant immunity. If you mutate three of them, it can still suppress innate immunity. But the quadruple mutant that's defective in all four of them, not only can it not suppress innate immunity, but now it itself is now an inducer of plant innate immunity. So I'm just showing you here. This is a water infiltrated rice leaf. This is wild type XO bacterium, triggers very few uh, callous deposits. This is the original type 3 secretion system defective mutant that can't secrete any T3S effectors into rice cells. And these are the callous deposits that it actually produces. And this is the quadruple mutant that now starts inducing, eliciting plant innate immune responses. Okay, so even if you had three of them mutated, it will still behave like the wild type. But when all four are mutated, that's when it can no longer suppress innate immunity. So there is a functional redundancy in these, uh, uh, in these proteins for their functioning in rice, uh, suppression of rice in immunity. So that was uh, Dipanvita's work. So the next question was, okay, now we have four proteins that suppress rice in immunity. How do they suppress rice in immunity? Another PhD student now took up this particular problem. So the question here is, yes, we know that there are four ZOPs that suppress rice in immunity. How do these ZOPs suppress rice in immunity? Now, out of these four, I mean, a lot of experiments that she did, many of them, you know, some of them we were not able to show that, okay, this is the mechanism by which it suppresses innate immunity. But finally, what actually worked was that uh, she found that this ZOP Q, X, and Z. So out of those four proteins, three of them have motifs that allow them to bind to eukaryotic 1433 proteins. So 1433 proteins, as many of you know, are key adapters in eukaryotic signal transduction cascades. So these three ZOPs have motifs in them that allow them to bind to, bind to uh, eukaryotic cells. Okay. And as I just said, these 1433 proteins are key adapters in eukaryotic signal transduction pathways. And rice being a good eukaryote also has these 1433 proteins and they play very important roles in many physiological uh, responses in rice. Now, by this time, other groups had also shown that several Pseudomonas and Xanthomonas pathogens modulate host immune responses by binding through 14 So we were trying several things. Finally, this actually is what we focused on, that maybe it is these 14 binding proteins of the rice pathogen that are actually required for suppression of innate immunity. 
Now, so, so if that is the case, then the xanthomonas zoops should, should be able to bind to uh, uh, rice 1433 proteins. And it turns out that rice has seven such 1433 proteins. And these are called GFs as general regulatory factors because 1433 proteins play ubiquitous roles in, uh, uh, in regulation of eukaryotic signal transmission. Okay, then there are seven of them. So what she did was using, uh, this was a PhD student called Soini Dev. What she did was she cloned each of these rice proteins and each of these xanthomonas effectors. And in these two hybrid assays, she wanted to know if they interacted with each other. And it turns out that Zop Z does interact with this particular rice uh, 1433 protein. Zop X interacts with two of them. Zop Q interacts with another two of them. So each of these Zops is interacting with a different rice 1433 protein. Okay, and not only using uh, yeast to hybrid assays, but in vivo within the plant using what are called Biff C assays. If you're interested again, we can discuss what they are. She was able to show that yes, there is an interaction that is occurring. So the next question was, is this interaction necessary for suppression of plant innate immunity? So what she did was that she made mutations in the 1433 binding sites of ZOP Q X and Z and showed that mutations in the 1433 binding sites abolish the ability of these ZOPs to interact with rice 14 So that data I'm not showing you, but take it from that's also been published actually. So what she showed was that, yes, if you mutate the 1433 binding sites of these three ZOPs, they no longer interact with rice 14 proteins, and they are no longer able to suppress rice. Immunity. So it appears that the ZOPs of XO suppress rice immune responses through interaction with 1433 proteins. Now, just this is the only data slide that I'm actually going to be showing you. Uh, we are actually calculating the number of calos deposits in, uh, that are induced in rice after treatment with either water or the wild type BXO43s or wild type XO strain. Very few calos deposits are actually elicited. So that's what I told you, just the background level. If you, in, if you infiltrate the quadruple mutant that's defective in ZOP, Q, N, X, and Z, these are the number of calos deposits that are actually produced, okay? And into the quadruple mutant, if you put a vector onto which, through which we are going to add additional ZOPs, now that again doesn't suppress innate immunity. But into the quadruple mutant, just one ZOP, you put ZOP, Q alone, that will now bring down these calos deposits to what is actually close to the face of so just one ZOP is enough to suppress innate immunity. So in this ZOP-Q protein, we made a mutation, a serine to alanine change in the 1433 binding motif. And again, that begins to trigger. That again uh, abolishes the ability of ZOP-Q to suppress innate immunity. So for each of these ZOPs that are involved in interacting with 1433 proteins and suppression of innate immunity, we were able to make these mutations in the 1433 binding motifs and show that indeed interaction with 1433 proteins is necessary for, uh, uh, for this bacterium to suppress innate immunity. So the next question then is, what is the role of these 1433 proteins in elaboration of rice innate immunity? So there is some work that these 1433 proteins are doing in, during signal transduction, uh, 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 during elaboration of rice innate immunity, what is their role? And this is something that I will be carrying forward in ICGB New Delhi. What our initial results suggest is that at least four of these proteins appear to be positive regulators of rice immune responses. And if you're interested, we can discuss what these uh, initial results are. But what we think is that, yes, these proteins may positive roles in triggering innate immunity. By interacting with them, XOO is able to suppress rice innate immunity. So, 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 so far, what I've told you is that the bacterium secrete cell wall degrading enzymes. They trigger pathogen triggered immunity and the bacterium uses, so PTI is induced and the bacterium uses the ZOPs to suppress PTI. Okay. But the story doesn't end there. What I will tell you now is that these proteins, these ZOPs that suppress PTI, rice is somehow, we have not figured out the mechanism, 
rice recognizes their presence and triggers effective treatment immunity. And how did we, uh, and, and that the bacterium can actually suppress. So this is the second layer of innate immunity. The bacterium is able to suppress this also. And that is what I will show you in the next few slides. Now, what, uh, what uh, Sohini Dev found out, again, this was published in 2020, is that ZOP Q, so two of these ZOPs, they actually interact with each other, ZOP Q and ZOP X. In all our assays to look at suppression of innate immunity, we were delivering only one protein at a time. For some reason, again, I won't go into the details, Dipanvita actually, I mean, uh, uh, Sohini Dev looked at introducing both of them into rice. And what she found was that when ZOPQ and ZOPX are introduced together into rice, which is probably what happens when exobacterium infects rice, in the absence of other T3S effectors, that results in suppression, in, in, in induction of innate immunity. So ZOPQ, ZOPX by themselves, if they go into rice, they trigger the second layer of the rice innate immunity. And I'll just show you a few of the, just one slide, that there are other T3S effectors. So I told you that there are at least 16 proteins that go into rice, you know, through that XO secretes into rice. Four of them are involved in separation of PTI, the first layer of the innate, innate immune response. What uh, Soini showed is that there are five other effectors that are involved in suppression of the second layer of the plant. So these five, any one of these can actually suppress ZOPQ, ZOPX mediated innate immunity. So let me show you this. This is the agrobacterial strain through which we introduce these effectors into rice. And you can see if you introduce just this, there's very minimal calorie deposition. If you put both ZOPQ and ZOPX simultaneously, they're introduced into rice. You can see a lot of these calorie deposits that are being produced. Along with ZOPQ and ZOPX, if we introduce this third effector called ZOPQ, that again, suppresses the immunity. Okay, so, so what we think is happening is that, yes, ZOPQ and ZOPX together, if you introduce, that triggers the second layer of rice innate immunity, and there are effectors that are around to, to suppress the second layer. So this ZOPG protein, so this particular protein uh, that suppresses this innate immunity, what uh, Sony was able to show is that, ZOPG physically interacts with these two proteins and that this interaction is needed for the protein to suppress uh, 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 ZOPQ, ZOPX triggered immunity. And what we think happening is that ZOPG, when it binds to these two proteins, it alters their intracellular localization. Again, I won't go into the details. So once that intracellular localization is, uh, is affected, so we think that ZOPG may be suppressing immune responses through physical sequestration or altered localization of ZOPQ and ZOPX. Now, it's a bit complicated, all of this, what I've told you. I'm just summarizing it here. As I told you in the beginning, there are two layers of the plant innate immune system. And what the XO bacterium is doing is through cooperative action of multiple xanthomonas effectors, it suppresses, it, it, it actually suppresses both layers of the plant innate immune system. So, Xanthomonas secrete cell wall degrading enzymes. That cell wall damage triggers pathogen triggered innate immunity. That's the first layer that is triggered. These two proteins, ZOPQ and ZOPX, are involved in suppression of PTI. But those two proteins also trigger the second layer of the plant innate immune response. So if PTI is triggered or if ETI is triggered, there is an immune response that is mounted and plant is resistant. But it suppresses PTI using ZOPQ and ZOPX. Those two trigger an immune response and it uses other effectors to suppress this effector triggered immunity. So when both layers of the plant innate immune system are inactivated, that is when immune suppression results in disease development. So when we see the disease lesion, it's all of these things that are actually happening uh, underneath. So now just a few minutes, I'll tell you about what are the, so we are saying that, yes, there are rice functions that, you know, rice immune responses are being triggered by cell wall damage. If there are such proteins, uh, if there are such functions in rice, we should be able to identify them. So we should be able to identify rice functions that are involved in elaboration of cell wall damage induced innate immunity. 
for lack of time, I'm not going to show you the data. Some of it is already published. What we have shown is that a particular receptor kinase that's located in the plant plasma membrane and closely interacts with the cell wall. This particular receptor kinase is serving either as a receptor or a co-receptor that initiates cell wall damage triggered in it. So there is a receptor, as I told you earlier, the layer one of the plant innate immune system is triggered by receptors that are in the plasma membrane. We think that this VACL21 is either the receptor or a co-receptor. And that work we published in plant physiology again in 2020. So we think we have something that's close to the point where signal is perceived. And we also, and this is work that has not been published yet, we have identified a transcription factor that appears to be a downstream activator of cell wall damage induced innate immunity. So knockdown of expression of either VACL21 or this transcription factor results in reduced immune responses in response, uh, immune responses in response to cell wall damage. So to sort of give you a simplified uh, picture of how we think the layer one of innate immunity works in rice. There is a plasma in the plasma membrane, there is a receptor kinase, OS VACL21. So I'm showing you here that this may be the receptor for identifying the cell wall degradation products that is released, but it may not be the receptor. It could also be a core receptor because we have not shown any physical interaction between the eliciter and the receptor. So it could be a receptor or a core receptor, but we think it is involved in uh, very early steps of signal perception. Once that signal is perceived, we think that there is a MAC kinase signaling cascade that is actually activated. This MAC kinase, and again, if you're interested, we can discuss later as to how this, how we think a MAC kinase signaling cascade is involved. This particular receptor kinase triggers that uh, MAC kinase signaling cascade, and we think that multiple 1433 proteins are involved in signal transduction during this pathway. And all of this results in activation of RELJ1, that transcription factor that I was telling you about, as well as other executive, uh, executive transcription factors. Once these transcription factors are activated, so none of these need to happen. If you overexpress these, if you activate their transcription, that will result in defense response and persistence. So this is our simplified scheme for activation of layer one of innate immunity. And what we think the bacterium is doing is that, so in the signal transduction cascade where the 1433 proteins are functioning, these effectors will come, they'll block the 1433 proteins, and that prevents, even if the receptor gets activated, the signal doesn't get transduced. There is no activation of transcription factors, no defense response, and hence there is susceptibility. So to summarize, there are virulence factors like cell wall degrading enzymes, they trigger layer one of the plant innate immunity. That gets suppressed by the bacterium using certain type three secretion system secreted effectors. They themselves are actually, uh, you know, these proteins that suppress layer one, they trigger layer two of the innate immunity. And once that gets triggered, again, the bacterium has certain proteins to suppress CTI. So it's able to suppress PTI and ETI. That's how it's able to pass this. This is probably the model that's happening in all plants that, you know, the bacterium or a fungus has the capability to inactivate both layer one and layer two of the plant innate immune system. That's how they're able to cause disease. But the story doesn't end there because if it ended there, then the bacterium would be able to eat up all the rice plants and you won't have any rice plants available. What rice is doing, and this is occurring at the population level at different parts of the world, is that the plant is actually evolving certain resistance genes. And these resistance genes are effective against certain races of the pathogen. In that locality, whatever is the strain that is present, the bacterium is able, the plant is able to evolve resistance genes. And what these resistance genes are, some new kinds of uh, receptors that trigger innate immunity, and there are certain genes called susceptibility factors. Again, we can discuss what they are. Mutations in those also give rise to resistance. Right now, just think that there are resistance genes that are present in the plant. And uh, so this is the disease actually. Bacterial blight, this is what it can do. And this is in a place 
very close to where I used to be working in Hyderabad. And the agricultural, local agricultural university approached us and said that this is a major rice growing area, a variety called Samba Masuri. It's a very, very highly valued rice variety. And for some reason, the variety grown in this particular part of the country is the one that gets the most premium. But that those harvests were getting severely affected by the disease. And they wanted to know whether we could come up with a solution for this particular problem. So again, for many years, we worked on it. So this variety called Samba Masuri, it has exceptional quality characters. Other than what is called the basmati rice, which has aroma, this is the, if you remove that, amongst other rice varieties, this is the most highly valued rice variety. Now, it is a favorite of consumers and farmers, but it was susceptible to this disease. And there are no bactericides for controlling the disease. So what we did was that, again, this is a multi-year project in collaboration with a laboratory of the Indian Council of Agricultural Research, which is called the Indian Institute of Rice Research. And fortunately for us, that was also located in Hyderabad. We first set out to understand the genetic diversity of this pathogen collected strains from different locations, looked at their uh, uh, diversity, which one of the resistance genes that are present in rice would be effective against the exome pathogen. So we looked at the pathogen in India. You can say it's an epidemiology. Then we started looking at which would be the effective resistance genes. And fortunately for us, other people had actually mapped these resistance genes and identified certain DNA markers that are very close to these resistance genes. So by using these DNA markers as surrogate markers for the presence of the resistance genes, we were able to introduce all these three resistance genes into the Samba Musuri background using a method called molecular marker resisted selection. If any of you are inter interested, we can discuss that later. But right now, just think that we've used this method. And what we did was that this is Samba Musuri, which has fine quality and is bacterial blood susceptible. This is the donor line. It turns out that there was a donor line available that had very poor quality and farmers were not growing it, but it had these three resistance genes. Using these DNA markers that had been already identified by other groups as surrogate markers for presence of the resistance gene, we transferred these three into the Samba Musiri background using backcross breeding and this method called marker resistance selection. If some of you are interested, we can discuss that later. But net effect is that we were able to transfer these three resistance genes into Samba Masuri, make sure that the rest of the genome actually comes from Samba Masuri. So getting resistance is of no use if the quality is poor, because this variety is not being grown. So when we transferred these into Samba Masuri, we had to make sure that its quality stays intact. And again, you know, using this backcross breeding strategy, we were able to do that. And we got this variety called that we called improved Samba Masuri that has fine quality, high yield all good characteristics coming from here and the bacterial disease resistance coming from it. And we went back to the same areas where the disease was a problem. So this was, I think, in 2011, actually, we were testing it. So this is Samba Musuri, the original variety, and you can actually see it's drying up. The farmer that was growing it that year got zero value out of that field. He actually burnt the field because he didn't feel that it was, you know, he didn't want to spend the money to harvest it. It was just not worth it to pay the labor for harvesting. But right next to it is improved Samba Musuri. And you can actually see it's totally green. So uh, now since that time, every year the bacteria, this variety is being grown there. And now it has spread to other parts of India where this disease is a problem and Samba Musuri is cultivated. So it's a niche area that is being targeted. Samba Musuri is grown and the disease is occurring there. And between 2012 to 2020, we think that the total produce of by growing this is about $800 million. Now, in the last three years, that has probably gone to about a billion dollars. But what is important is what is called the trait value. What is the value that the farmer is getting by growing improved Samba Musuri instead of Samba Musuri? And that works out for that eight year period, it's about $160 million. So it's a small innovation, doesn't require that much investment in terms of money, but it actually makes a lot of difference to, to the farmers. So what next? What we are actually doing is we're working on both sides. We are looking at the basic research on rice innate immunity and 
what we are trying to do is what are these 1433 proteins doing in rice to you know as positive activators of innate immunity what are some of these other proteins as i said there is a map k6 that's involved in elicitation of cell wall damage in innate immunity we are trying to find out and particularly i'm looking at in you know, icgb what the role of these 1433 proteins is in triggering cell wall damage in innate immunity then how does interaction of these 1433 proteins with zops you know enable suppression of rice innate immunity so these are the two areas that we'll be focusing on and is also not clear how these zops trigger effector trigger immune responses so what are the rice receptors that are involved in activating the second layer of the innate immune system how does that suppression occur we are also looking for alternate sources of resistance against this bacterium because you know the pathogen is going to evolve over a period of time to break down the resistance we have to be ready with other sources of resistance and we are also adding other additional traits into improved samba mosuri by adding resistance to fungal disease submergence tolerance drought tolerance many other things we are adding now a lot of people are involved in csr ccmb which was where i used to work most of my career has been there and then at the national institute of plant genome research where i was working for a few years as the director now some of you may know hitendra kumar patel he did his phd from icgb with vitorio he is now he has been a long term collaborator and now that i have moved out of ccmb he is the one who is carrying forward this rice work so he has been a constant collaborator for me in all the projects that I've and uh, sohini dev is the one who has done most of the work that i have talked about today on suppression of rice innate immunity and in induction of rice innate immunity many people have contributed including chandan who is here in the in the audience because i focused on this i didn't i didn't have the time to talk about our work on this aspect then we have been working on the cell wall degrading enzymes the bacterium secretes an interesting process called phase variation in this bacterium maybe another time when i come i'll talk about it and we are involved in developing novel rice varieties we've had collaborators at ccmb at the national institute of plant genome research and at the institute of microbial technology dr prabhu patel and his group has now got the genome sequences of number of these exo bacteria so what we can actually now do is we can actually predict what are the changes that are likely to occur in these strains to enable them to break down in root samples and we can now work it's basically a knowledge guided design of resistance genes to combat possible breakdown of resistance and we had a very fruitful collaboration with researchers at the indian institute of rice research dr sundaram dr seshu madhav who work at the indian institute of rice research and dio mishra who works in bayer crop science he had a huge collection of exo strains from all over india and those we actually again did the same thing looked at their genetic diversity then back to see many of them can break down improved samba mosuri and based on their genetic composition we are now trying to predict how the bacterium is likely to evolve in the future to break down resistance and how we can combat it i think i'll stop here thank you very much